In this video, I'm going to go through the design of a capacitive discharge unit that I have designed for my model railway. This is currently in prototyping phase, as I'll be incorporating this into a bigger point controller circuit in the future. I'll be explaining about my unique design, some of the design decisions I've made, including some which were based on problems I encountered during the initial testing. These are the topics I'll be covering. These are chapters within the video, so you can skip straight to the appropriate place if you prefer. I'll be explaining a bit more about the different types of model railway points, or depending upon where you live, you may call these model rail road switches or turnouts. I'll then talk about the capacitor discharge circuits and why they are useful. Then go on to show about a particular version of the capacitive discharge unit that I've made, which is based around a MOSFET. I initially designed this in theory and then tested it. The initial version was partly successful, but it did not work as quite as I wanted, so I made some design improvements, which I'll also cover. I'll show how that can be incorporated with the mechanical switch point controls. Then I want to explain about my future plans, including how I intend to use a Raspberry Pi Pico in my future switching plans. So do watch to the end of the video to find out more. First, what do I mean by points? because if you're not from the UK, you may know these by a different name. In the UK, we normally call them railway points. The common term in the US is a railroad switch. They may also be known as a railway junction or a railroad crossing. On a real railway, then the points were traditionally controlled by mechanical levers, either at the side of the track or from a signal box. In modern railways, they're often controlled using a point motor or switch motor. And this can be an electric motor or it could be used in hydraulic or pneumatic actuators. On a model railway, then to operate these electronically, we normally use a solenoid, although there are other alternatives, such as a servo motor. In this case, I'm only covering solenoids, and I've tested using a variety of different manufacturers, including Gagemaster, Hornby, and unbranded solenoids, as well as looking at underboard, overtrack, and on surface mount point motors. As I've said, this is for solenoid-based motors only. So let's look at the solenoid in more details. This is a 3D model, approximately based on a typical underboard point motor. There are other designs, but mostly they work on the same principle. The blue rectangle is a PCB holding the components and providing a place to connect the wires to. This is normally connected to the breadboard, although on some designs, there may be a metal frame that can be either mounted under the breadboard or connected directly to the point. For point motors mounted on top of the board, known as surface mount point motors, then these may work in the same way, but often have a mechanism so that the movement is turned by 90 degrees, allowing the point motor to be horizontal alongside the point. The cylinder sticking up is the pin, which will move the slider of the point from one side to another. This is connected to the larger silver coloured cylinder which is known as the armature or plunger. The armature moves from left to right based on the direction shown in the image, which is based on whether the coil on the left or the right is activated. I've coloured the coils yellow and green to make it easier to see, but in reality these are often black or you can sometimes see the copper wires. Energising one of the coils will cause the armature to move towards that coil. This video is shown in slow motion. In reality, these switch much faster. Note that all the references to left and right are relative. It depends upon where the point is and which direction you're looking at them from. This is a basic circuit diagram of how you may connect up a typical point motor. The point motor is the box labeled as a solenoid, which is shown as two inductors to represent the two coils. The connections A and B are used for the two coils and the C is the common connection. And this is based on the labels used by Gage Master and other manufacturers on their point motors. I've shown this power supply as 15 volts DC. Depending upon the particular point motor, this could be a DC or AC supply between 12 and 24 volts. I'll talk about this later when I discuss the design of the capacitor discharge unit in more details. There's a single pole double throw switch, center off, and then two terminals for the outputs. This is a momentary switch which will go back to the off position when disconnected. This is very important, as I'll explain shortly. When the switch is moved to the top position, then it will energize the coil at the right and move the point towards the right. 
When the switch is moved to the bottom position, it will energize the coil on the left and move the point towards the left. When the switch is released, it moves to the center position and neither coil is energized. In this case, the solenoid will typically remain where it is, often because of the mechanical point mechanism, which has a spring action. But you can also get latching point motors if required. So this is an example of a simple switch that can be used to control the point motors. It's a momentary switch, single pole, double throw. Single pole means you only get one set of terminals and double throw means it can switch both ways. This has a third centre position which is not connected to any pins. So that gives an on, off, on configuration. The lever will return to the centre off position when not physically pushed. As I mentioned previously, there are a number of problems with using this simple switch mechanism. Firstly, point motor burnout. The solenoid coils are designed to be operated for only a short period of time. If you hold the switch in one direction, then the energised coil will overheat and eventually burn out. The capacitor discharge unit will prevent this by only allowing the current to flow for a short period of time. Another problem is the inrush current used to operate the solenoid. This is common to many electromagnetic devices in that when a coil is first energised it has a very low resistance and will let a lot of current flow. As the magnetic field builds up then it will resist the flow of current and so will reduce but the initial surge is known as an inrush. The inrush can be a large demand on your transformer or power supply meaning that you need a more powerful power supply. It can also cause voltage spikes and dips, which can be bad for other electronics connected to the same power supply. The switch in can be unreliable. This is due to the momentary action of the switch and the dip in voltage when the solenoid is first connected. Again, this is something the capacitive discharge unit hopes to improve. Using a solenoid with a switch can cause wear in the switch, in particular due to arcing when a large current is switched. This is particularly the case with DC voltages as the switches can often switch a much higher AC supply. This switch can handle up to 5 amps on DC, so should not be a problem, but switching large currents within the switch can cause a reduction in the lifespan of the switch. I'm also eventually looking to add electronic control so that I can control the switches using a microcontroller or a computer. So these last two are not going to be fixed by the capacitor discharge unit on its own, but they will be included in my later solution. So I'll come back to those in a future video. The solution to these problems is a capacitor discharge unit. The concept is straightforward enough. Rather than relying on the power supply to provide a large current to drive the solenoid, we instead use a capacitor. The capacitor can be charged up and then release its charge through the solenoid. In its most basic form, we could literally just put a capacitor across the power supply as it connects to the switch. But whilst that would help with the inrush and potentially could help with the reliability, it doesn't help with the risk of burnout of the solenoid. And this is where the transistor, or in my case a MOSFET, will come in. The aim being to charge the capacitor through the transistor, which will turn off when the solenoid is energised. This will prevent the solenoid from being able to pull a large current from the power supply. A commonly available circuit uses an NPN bipolar transistor, where I prefer to use MOSFET. One being that it's consistent with the use of MOSFETs, which are going to be elsewhere in my circuit. But also, MOSFETs generally have a smaller voltage drop. It also removes the need of a high power resistor, which is used in the transistor circuit. Although sometimes that's replaced with four lower power resistors, it still needs multiple resistors or that high power resistor. This is the final circuit design or at least the final for this first prototyping stage that I'm doing at the moment. As always there may be further opportunity to tweak this later if it's needed. I'll explain some of the design reasons later but for now I'll give you an explanation of how it works. First I've shown a 12 volt power supply but this can be greater than 12 volts. At this point it should be DC. If you're using an AC power supply, which is fairly common in model railways, then this should go through a diode first. I do actually have a diode in my overall circuit, but I've used a hierarchical circuit design in KeyCAD, so it's included further up the hierarchy. But if you're certain you have a DC power supply and won't be connecting it the wrong way around, then it's not really needed anyway. 
It's for this reason there's no D1 diode, as that's further up the hierarchy, which will be discussed in future videos. So if we start with this circuit powered off and with the capacitors shown C1, C2 are both discharged. So these two capacitors are shown as 2200 microfarad capacitors, although you could replace with one 4700 microfarad capacitor instead. And if you wanted a more powerful CDU, you could even use a pair of 4700 microfarad capacitors. The capacitors are initially discharged and need to be charged. As a result of these capacitors having no charge in them, they'll have a low voltage across them. And this means that pin 3 of this MOSFET, Q1, which is the source, will be at a low voltage as well. The gate, which is pin 1, will be pulled high through resistor R1. So with there being no load on the output, the gate is pulled up high and so the MOSFET turns on, allowing a current which will flow through R2 to charge the capacitors. I'll come to R2 later. Once the capacitors are charged, this LED will light up to indicate that it's ready for use. And the charging is normally quite fast, less than half a second. Then, when a solenoid is connected to the output, the current can flow from these capacitors through diode D2 and to the solenoid. The solenoid coil has very low resistance and pulls the gate down low, switching the MOSFET off. This means that the current is supplied by capacitors C1 and C2 and not directly from the power supply. There will also be a small current through the R1 which goes directly to the output, but because I've used a MOSFET the pull-up resistor has a high resistance, so the current through that part of the circuit is very small which compares to the transistor circuit, which would need a high power resistor, or sometimes four resistors in parallel to avoid that. Diode D2 is a Schottky rectifier diode. This diode will take the full current from the capacitors to the solenoid, so a large 1N5820 diode is used. These can handle a maximum average current of 3 amps, but more for a short period of time, which allows for the initial hit and rush. It has a low forward voltage drop, reducing the amount of power wasted. It's a physically large diode, and the leads were too big for the breadboard, which was used for prototyping the design, so I had to solder temporary wires to that. The diode D3 is a flyback diode, which prevents damage to the circuit from the back voltage caused by any induced current when the solenoid coil is deactivated. This can produce a high voltage spike, so I've used a 1N4000 series diode, which can cope with higher voltages than the shock tip rectifier diodes used elsewhere. In this particular example, I've shown a 1N4003. The MOSFET used is an IRL B8721 N channel MOSFET. This is high maximum voltage of 20 volts and can handle more than enough current at 62 amps. We won't be going anywhere near that. An alternative I did look at was the STP36NF06L, which may be more commonly available and is slightly cheaper. The STP36NF06L has a maximum voltage of 18 volts, which will cope with the 19 volt supply with the additional diode and allowing for resistor R2, and it can easily cope with the current, but the IRL B8721 allows for better tolerances when using with the 19 volt power supply. The resistor R1 is used as a pull-up resistor for the MOSFET gate. On the bipolar transistor version of this circuit, it needed to have a low value of around 500 ohms, and that allowed a current to flow through it when the solenoid was activated. The current was still relatively small, but it was enough to heat up the resistor. As a result, a 1 watt resistor was needed. This is higher than a typical through hole resistors, which are normally half or quarter watt. An advantage of using a MOSFET is that it does not need the same current into the gate as would be needed through the base of a transistor. So a higher value of 2.2 kilo ohm has been used and that's removed the need for a high power resistor. Originally I didn't have a resistor where R2 was, instead connecting the source of the MOSFET directly to the capacitors. The problem with that is that the MOSFET would switch on very quickly 
and if the capacitors were discharged, that would result in a large inrush current to charge the capacitors. In some cases, enough to trip the current limiter on my bench power supply. This is one of the things that this circuit is trying to avoid, reducing the large inrush current. So I added a 22 ohm resistor there. This is enough to reduce the inrush without slowing the charger of the capacitors too much. With that resistor, I was able to reduce the overcurrent protection to 500 milliamps and it didn't trip. That works out about 10 watts. This is only for a very short period of time when the capacitors are fully discharged. Once they start to charge, then the amount of current will go down. So it doesn't put too much of an inrush current on the power supply. Initially in my design, I used two 1000 microfarad capacitors, which gave a total of 2000 microfarads. This worked well on the point motor I was doing my initial testing on, but did not hold enough charge for one of the point motors on the model railway layout. It only affected a couple of motors and only in certain circumstances, but because of that, I increased these to two 2200 microfarads, giving a total of 4400 microfarads, which worked more reliably. This could be replaced with a single 4,700 microfarad capacitor or even two 4,700 microfarad capacitors, which would give a very strong throw of the point motor. In my original design, I put 12 volt as a required power supply. I was hoping to make use of a 12 volt power supply. In testing, I found that some of the point motors I had would not switch reliably when I used a 12 volt power supply. In particular, the Hornby surface mount motors required 12 to 17 volts DC or 15 volts AC, but they did not switch when I first tried with 12 volts. There is some voltage drop within the circuit, which may account for that. But they did work better when I increased the capacitor values as mentioned previously. So maybe I could have stuck with 12 volts, but because of this, I'm now looking to run at 19 volts DC instead. And technically 19 volts is outside the range of some of my point motors, but again, as there is some voltage lost in the circuits through the diodes and the MOSFET, so it should be fairly close to the maximum of 17 volts, which is the Hornby surface mount point motor. 19 volts is however a good voltage, as it's commonly used in laptop power supplies. And as laptops have been moved in over to USB-C, it means there's generally a good supply of unused 19 volt power supplies. If you're using this circuit, then please check the permitted supply voltage for your own point motors. Whilst many of the point motors work up to 24 volts, some do have a lower maximum voltage. The circuit will work with different power supply DC voltages from 12 volts up to about 20 volts. So please ensure to choose a power supply that is suitable for your needs. Returning to the mechanical switch circuit I showed previously, it's just a case of replacing the 15 volt power supply with a capacitive discharge unit. The common terminal of the solenoid is connected to ground. This is coloured black on the Hornby point motors. For the others, I had to add my own wires. I've also gone with black to be common with the Hornby ones. Black wires are normally associated with the ground connection, but that will not always be the case with this, as it could be quite easily that the common terminal is used for the positive supply and the ground circuit is switched instead. In fact, that's most likely how I'll be doing it when I come to the next stage. Whilst the capacitor discharge unit can be used in standalone circuit with the mechanical switches, I'm planning to use this to provide electronic control of model railway points. I'm potentially looking at three different ways of controlling the points, which are likely to be based around a Raspberry Pi Pico. One using switches, but avoiding the high current flowing through the mechanical switches. One using a web interface, and possibly a graphical interface using a Raspberry Pi or a laptop. If any of these sound like they'll be interesting, then please let me know in the comments. Please subscribe if you haven't already, click on the notifications icon to make sure you get notified about the future videos, and please give this video a like if you found it useful. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in a future video.